Hi, I'm Tim Tyler, and this is a video which responds to one of Stephen Pinker's criticisms of memetics, the one where he questions whether or not it makes sense to talk of Romeo and Juliet evolving into a West Side Story. In my book on memetics, which is out now, I take a look at some of the critics and criticisms of memetics. Stephen Pinker is one of those critics. Pinker expressed a number of objections to memetics in a 2009 Harvard lecture, and in this particular video we'll look at his assertion that the process of evolution of Romeo and Juliet into West Side Story has little in common with the process responsible for industrial melanism. Here's Stephen. So we know, for example, that Shakespeare was strongly influenced by Ovid and Plutarch, that uh, Leonard Bernstein and Stephen Sondheim were influenced by Shakespeare when they came up with the plot of uh, West Side Story based on Romeo and Juliet. But I, I think that it would be extremely misleading to say that the process by which Sondheim developed West Side Story from Romeo and Juliet has anything interesting in common with the process by which a white moth uh, begat a black moth starting off the process of industrial melanism. The, uh, that, that, that kind of analogy really is, uh, is superficial rather than deep. And the reason is, what is the similarity? What is the relationship between Romeo and Juliet and West Side Story? It's not that there were some blind changes. There was, wasn't one generation of blind variation. There weren't a hundred generations of blind variation. It's rather that there was a, a rather deep and abstract uh, analogical similarity which the human brain is capable of recognizing involving concepts like kinship, clan, revenge, vendetta, romance, and so on, uh, which is what allows composers and audiences to discern the similarity that allows one to be adapted into another. That's nothing like the process by which variation arises in the case of biological evolution. Stephen says that to compare the way in which West Side Story was developed from Romeo and Juliet with the way in which a white moth changes into a black moth as part of the process of industrial melanism would be misleading. So what these processes have in common is that they are both instances of evolution and consist of variation, copying and selective retention. However, evolution takes place using a wide range of different mechanisms and there's no particular reason for any two evolutionary processes to be particularly similar to each, to each other. So, for example, the KT extinction event is not much like industrial melanism either, although both are still forms of evolution. Similarly, variation in evolution arises using a range of mechanisms and there should not necessarily be any expectation for two of them to look very similar. So, for example, cosmic rays are quite different to ploidy changing events in polyploid crops, which in turn are quite different from endosymbiotic symbiogenesis. Pinker is essentially pointing out that memetics has a hard time handling creative processes. Saying that memetics does a poor job of explaining human creativity is actually a common complaint of critics of the field. It certainly isn't the strongest point of memetics, but there's a good reason for that. Memetics is strongest in the area of population memetics. So, for example, it does an excellent job of explaining why the Indo-European languages form a branching tree with a common ancestor, why long isolated islands tend to have backwards cultures, why high population densities result in greater contagious spread of ideas, and so on. From the perspective of population memetics, a single creative act is just a type of mutation. Now, we can model mutations in ideas, but because we don't yet have a complete model of the mind, and we don't yet know how to build a mind, the results are not that great. The models which are used are typically ones that are used in conventional psychology and don't owe much to genetics. Population memetics, which is really the most successful branch of memetics, typically doesn't bother very much with modelling mutations at all, and instead it just tracks population level processes. Treating the mind as a black box and mostly ignoring what goes on inside it has been a wildly successful strategy and has resulted in substantial progress in population memetics within academia, much as the exact same strategy has done in population genetics. Of course, West Side Story was not just one creative act, but dozens of them, and I'm sure there was a great deal of trial and error in getting the right dance moves, music, lyrics, and so on. So it does make reasonable sense to compare it to other evolutionary processes, but I think we should start by making some effort to compare like with like. In the case of Stephen's example, he selected an instance where there are some similarities, but also some distracting differences. In both industrial melanism and the creation of West Side Story, we have an ancestral form adapting to a different modern environment, 
However, there are also some differences which interfere with the comparison by introducing irrelevant noise. In industrial melanism, single lineages independently change form, whereas West Side Story consists of quite a mixture of different cultural lineages. So the script had one set of cultural parents, while the choreography, the lyrics and the music each had their own different sets of ancestors with their own separate descendants and life cycles. So West Side Story is more like a complex symbiosis than a single species. One might compare it to a patch of forest. In keeping with the theme of adapting to a modern environment, we might imagine a forest ecosystem attempting to invade a modern city environment. I think this is a fairer comparison, which does a better job of attempting to compare like with like. Stephen points out that one of the differences between these two types of systems is that West Side Story is, particularly, is partially the product of mimetic engineering. That's a fair enough difference to point out. Engineered systems are indeed a bit different from ones that are not engineered. To produce a comparable forest, one would have to introduce genetic engineers. However, the mere introduction of some genetic engineers doesn't stop the forest evolving. Using engineering speeds up evolutionary change, much as deliberative selective breeding did before it, and much as unconscious selective breeding did before that. But it doesn't stop the forest from evolving and changing and obeying the rules of evolutionary systems. One of the best ways of visualising the situation is to consider evolutionary change as taking place in systems which involve a range of different levels of intelligence. The stupidest types of evolution involve creatures with no brains that evolve using largely undirected mutations, and then we have creatures with brains, and creatures whose brains implement virtual worlds and can simulate the future, and then highly intelligent creatures which have mastered engineering. Pinker is comparing systems at opposite ends of this intelligence scale and claiming that variation arises in them in dissimilar ways. That's true. The systems vary in how much intel intelligence is involved, and the smarter systems can make use of more interesting forms of generating variation. However, both systems still evolve. They still exhibit copying, variation and selective retention, so evolution is what these processes have in common. Although the details of the way in which variation arises are different in these two systems, that is perfectly acceptable because variation in evolution arises in a large number of different ways which can be very different from each other. We already know and understand that. It is absolutely fine for variation to arise in many different ways that do not necessarily resemble one another. It does not represent some kind of problem. Evolution simply does not imply a lack of intelligence. That's just a basic misunderstanding of what the term evolution means. Yes, ignorant creationists who want to introduce intelligence into evolution should be combated, but not by changing the definition of evolution. That term is clearly explained in the evolution textbooks. Intelligence is not excluded. It doesn't get a mention, and nor should it. Brains no more prevent evolution by thinking than our kidneys prevent evolution by filtering our blood. Enjoy.